Welcome and thank you all for joining us. My name is Katie Porter and I'm Executive Director of Inlandia Institute, a literary and cultural arts nonprofit based in Inland Southern Welcome. California. And thank Before we begin, Inlandia Institute respectfully acknowledges and recognizes our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air. The Cahuilla, Tongva, Luiseño, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, the Inlandia region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we express our gratitude to them for allowing us the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Tonight's program is in partnership with the Riverside Public Library and the California School for the Deaf Riverside for First Thursday's Arts Walk at Home. And it is in commemoration of both National Deaf History Month and National Poetry Month. And tonight we bring you award-winning poet Meg Day in conversation with Ryan Fingerly, Riverside City College student poet and editor for RCC's Lit Journal News, and special guest, Erica Thompson, and the winners of the National ASL Story Signing Competition, who we'll hear from in just a moment. But first, a few housekeeping notes. Closed captioning is enabled for this event via the CC icon on, at the bottom of your screen. We would also like to extend special thanks to our team of interpreters, Emily, Sue, and Laura. We couldn't do this without you. And for our viewers, please note, this is a view only presentation and it is being recorded. Any questions for our presenters, please type into the Q&A box. And now about our program. Launched by the Academy of American Poets in April 1996, National Poetry Month reminds the public that poets have an integral role to play in our society. Likewise, the National Association of the Deaf launched National Deaf History Month in 1997 to commemorate the achievements of people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Did you know that the city of Riverside is home to one of only two schools in the state serving our deaf and hard of hearing students? Here on behalf of Riverside's California School for the Deaf, Erica Thompson will introduce our very special guests, Sal, Macy, and Gabrielle. And if you have any questions for Erica or for our students, please type them in the Q and A. Welcome, Erica. Hi, my name is Erica Thompson. I work um, as an information, um, information officer and coordinator with CSDR. Um, that's the deaf school in Riverside, California. And the um, shortened version is CSDR. I'm gonna go ahead and show you the slides we have. Okay, California School for the Deaf. Um, is involved with positive education for the students and enriching their culture. It's important to um, Lord. All right, uh, the interpreter Sue is having some issues with her video. Uh, Laura, can you help? 
students, the R for Riverside, that's the sign for Riverside. Just reading the slide here. And now Riverside has served deaf students 12 counties overall in Southern California. We are a district, we have many different schools, including early childhood education, students as young as 18 months and up. There's middle, elementary, middle and high school. We also have CIF athletic programs. We have student uh, outings where the students, some of them, about half of them, sleep during the week, excuse me, housing. Uh, and if it's as far as San Diego or San Luis Obispo, CSDR is home away from home, where students can be involved in the language enrichment environment and have communication with one another. And now we have a proud tradition of hosting different events, ASL poetry, ASL storytelling performances for students, family, community. This year, unfortunately, we can't have them in person because of the pandemic. We had to put that on hold, but it isn't gonna stop us and our students from participating in the Gallaudet University National Literary Competition for young students up to high school. So the competition is ASL and English literary categories. The middle school decided to participate in ASL storytelling. We were so proud of our three students who won first and second place. We'll show their videotapes. I'd like to give a little bit about ASL storytelling, uh, this year's theme. Students had a three minute video, signing video. The theme was struggles and triumphs. With creative ASL and uh, you will be able to see the dialogue clearly from the shoulder shifting, then from left to right will be a different character in the story talking. So you might see, you know, quotes, lines in the story. It's the same kind of concept of dialogue. Um, and an example would be if you use your index finger as a classifier, that could mean a person. In this example, if a person were walking, you would see my index finger moving like that, but how was the person walking? If they were slouching, if they had posture, I would bend the index finger like this, or if they were hurrying along, if they were speeding, then um, that would be the sign how I would sign it. If they were loitering along, so. Because ASL storytelling has rich features of ASL, there isn't an equivalent spoken English translation that will do justice to the artistic work and creativity in the poetry. So before you watch the videos, we'll have a brief summary. And the interpreters might give a brief word during the video, but it's better to watch and take it in on your own. Uh, you can watch the video and during the Q&A, you can type in questions that you'd like to ask, okay? The first student is Sal. At the family home during sunset, the boy plays with a lighter, a lighter in some grass and ignites a huge fire. 
the boy frantically wakes up his parents who evacuate with the daughter in time before the house gets burned down. For days, the family struggles with being homeless in the street without money or clothing. They find a lottery ticket on the street and eventually win the jackpot. They buy a mansion and by the beach and enjoy their new home with a view of the sunset. At this time, the house just went up in flames and the boy is realizing that he lost everything. The boy just found a lottery ticket after living in destitution for a while. Now the family lives in comfort and is happy. The girl's parents compliment her on her artistic abilities and suggest that she takes art classes. However, upon arrival, they learn that the ASL interpreter will not be provided. When the teacher and boy uh, classmate try talking to her, the girl feels frustrated and is not understanding them. Eventually, an ASL interpreter appears in class and communication is clearly present. Everyone loves her work and they learn the ASL sign for painting. A young girl loves to draw and she's discussing with her mother about taking an art class. The student is so excited and has finally arrived to class.
unfortunately, communication is difficult because no interpreter is there to interpret for the deaf student and the teacher and student are struggling to communicate with each other. Another student is noticing the problem of lack of communication in the class because of no interpreter. Students feeling frustrated at the lack of access. They finally agreed to provide an interpreter and finally the student can understand what's happening in class and enjoy and participate with the rest of the students. The deaf student is teaching one of the other students in the class the sign for painting. Uh, Gabriella's story, a girl walks down the street as white people whisper and sneer nearby. She braves into a school for white students in an elegant building across the street from her own dilapidated school. She is shooed away by other classmates because of being black. She asks a girl to be friends with her, but keeps getting rejected. A fight erupts between a black and white student. A leader arises urging the white and black people to unite. The crowd listens and starts to accept being friends. The leader suddenly gets shot on the podium to everybody's shock, but they remain united in friendship. A young girl walks down the street. People are taunting and making fun of her and she notices um, two different schools on either side of her. There's a lot of tension between all of the students in the school. Soon a fight breaks out. The girl's asking to be friends with some of the other students and keeps getting rejected.
Students are all summoned together with a plea from someone up front to please come together and work together in unity. Suddenly the speaker is shot. Despite this tragic situation, they decide to come together and, and be friends. Wow, those are three very different stories. It's an um, creative writing. Some of it might be from personal experience or history. Um, that's what the topic was, was it was just based on success and triumphs. There was many different stories to look through um, if you'd like to see our stories again, we do have them posted on our social medias and they are posted on YouTube. And I believe that Inlandia had posted the YouTube links as well. Alrighty, are you guys ready to meet the students? We had Sal join us. So Sal, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Bravo, everybody. So let's go ahead and check the Q&A for any questions. Somebody asked Macy, or let's see. There's, if there's any questions for the three of you. So somebody did ask Macy. They were wondering, Macy, is your story based on a personal experience? Do you mind explaining a little bit about your personal experience? Was that in your own art class? Yeah, um, I can explain that a little bit. Um, I had taken an art class and I had gone, um, my parents said I could take it and I was excited to take it, um, but we struggled with the interpreter portion, getting access for that class. Um, and that was difficult. My parents finally said that I could go and we got an interpreter eventually. Um, but it was really difficult for me to understand before I got the interpreter. So I, I people were trying to talk to me and um, communication was difficult. Um, I ended up, I started in one class and I ended up in a different class um, that did provide an interpreter for me. So that was kind of based off of that experience. Yeah, and that's difficult for sure. You know, students outside of our school, that's that's a common experience. All right, and we have another question for all three of you. Somebody wants to know, where did you get your ideas, your inspiration for your stories? Uh, let's go ahead and start with Sal. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, hmm. I'm struggling to see if anyone wants to jump in. That'd be great. Um, um, stories that came from my mind. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, we have um, two. Let's see here. Um, was it a movie? Is that where you got the idea about the fire and winning the lottery ticket? I know that there's many different stories. And Gab Gabrielle, do you want to go next? Where did you get the idea for your story? Um, I went to a Black Lives Matter protest. 
And um, it gave me the inspiration for that story. There was some arguments and stuff going on there and I came up with the idea. Okay, we really enjoyed your imaginative stories and, and your experiences that you shared with us. Are you guys ready for another creative story competition next year? Or Macy says, something? absolutely. Yes, Gabrielle said, maybe. Maybe, Gabrielle, Gabrielle says. <laughs> Anybody else want to add any more um, questions, comments? Um, I'm just no, going to may I I jump that. in. This is Katie. Oh, okay. Hi, okay. I can't type anything in the Q&A, but I do have a question for our young writers. I wonder about process. Just a moment, oh, hold on. Go ahead, Katie. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank oh, you. I have one I more question. The monkey wrench in. Just, I'm curious about our young writer's process. If it's different writing a story in ASL than writing a story in English. I think so. Yes, Macy said. You think it's a similar part of it in any way? Gabrielle said it's really different. Sal has a comment. Sal's saying, for ASL, I think about it in my head and I come up with the idea. I kind of talk to myself through this and come up with the ideas. And then I write it out, um, write my thoughts out after I've processed through the signs. Yeah, it's definitely a different pro uh, process. Uh, you got to think about the structure for storytelling as well. Um, like, where is it? Who's involved in the plot and everything? And how everything gets resolved. So that would be similar in English. But when you're studying ASL storytelling, you have to think about more like poetry and in English. That's how you would think about how to set it up. Oh, Gabrielle, Gabrielle has a comment. comment. Um, oh, say it again. I missed it. Missed. Uh, is there any more questions or comments today? Oh, Janine from the panelists has a, a question. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Oh. There are three questions in the Q&A box. Oh, do you uh, tell your stories oh. to your friends? Thank you. Do you tend to be a storyteller? Gabrielle said, yeah, one time. Occasionally I tell my friends stories, sometimes. And Macy? I don't tell my friends, I keep them to myself. I think about them and I sign them to myself sometimes when I'm laying in bed. That's cool. Okay, let's see. Um, we do have another question. Um, how long have you guys been storytelling? Has it, have you been telling stories for a long time? When was the first time? Did you start when you were really little? It's been a while. I feel like I've always told stories, Sal says. And Macy? When I was seven? When I was seven, I remember telling my first I story. Learned sign language. I learned sign language when I was seven. I missed Gabrielle's. Okay, and then Macy, we have another question that they wanted, uh, Linda wanted to ask you. 
Uh, what is something that us hearing people can do to help communication, improve communication with the deaf? What's something you can tell hearing people? Yes, for Macy. My parents are hearing and never learned to sign. Um, so eventually they, they didn't at first when I was young and then they took sign language classes when they were older and they were able to teach me sign language. So learning sign language is something that can really help with communication with deaf and hearing people. It's always a benefit. So you want hearing people to learn sign? All of them, yes. I want all hearing people to learn sign language and be able to communicate with all of us. We wanna communicate with you. We wanna communicate with the whole world. Okay, and we have one more question from Judy asks, do you change the, the words or the signs for storytelling at all? you know, different from your everyday communication, when you're storytelling, does it change? Do your signs differ in any way? Sal says no. And she said, do you mean I changed the words? Macy's asking. Macy's clarifying the question. Oh, I think she's frozen. The students are saying, I believe Erica's video has frozen. Oh. I'm not sure Erica's frozen, Gabrielle says. Well, you know, I think um, that's just par for the course with technology. <laughs> it's okay, she'll be back. And I know Judy is a poet and I think that's what she's thinking about. One of you mentioned that the writing these stories in ASL is a lot like poetry. So I think uh, there's, we're, we'll be very interested to hear more about um, the differences, I think, between writing in ASL and writing in English and the nuances that might not transfer between the languages. So it's another um, incentive for those of us who don't know ASL to learn ASL so we can better understand it. Erica's back. I got disconnected there, but I got back in. Okay. Yeah. Internet issues, you know. Alrighty. Was that all? That's, that is all, I think. And thank you very much to all of our students and to Erica. So um, we're going to move on to the next portion Alrighty, and I want to thank you and the Riverside community for supporting us, supporting the school, the deaf school, uh -huh. and um, the language community in general. Uh, come Absolutely. back and see us, please. <laughs> we will. Thank you. We'll do this again. So, just a moment. Let's see. And. So let me make sure I have everything set that um, we should be good to go. So now um, I would like to lead us into the next part of our program. I would like to introduce Ryan Fingerly, who will read from her work and she will introduce our featured presenter, Meg Day. Ryan and Meg are both deaf poets with different styles and different um, kinds of poetry, but a lot in common. So Ryan Fingerly is a deaf writer and poet whose love of words has no boundaries. She is an editor for Muse and a front end developer for Fingerfly Friends, whose experience and passion is helping children and their families enjoy the merits of both ASL and the English language. So welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. 
And it's so wonderful, such a wonderful introduction, Katie. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm thrilled to be here. So I do love writing. Uh, it allows me to express myself open to a different reality. Poetry is an amazing outlet for memories and also emotions. I'll share a specific poem about my cousin's wedding back in 2019. And for me, this specific poem looks back on my memory as a special emotional time, this clip of during the wedding. And I do want to mention that my poem is written in English. So I do have a wonderful friend who is an ASL poet who translated my poet to, from English to ASL poetry, a beautiful visualization. So I do want to give you all a warning that this is going to be my first time signing poetry in ASL. So I might make a few errors. Please just bear with me, OK? Okay. Typically, I'm the only one who can't hear. Yet I see so many smiles, whispering and laughter. So many unknowns. Thankfully, I sit next to my father. His presence overcomes my insecurity. His smile comforts me. The music starts. Everyone stands and turns in unison. The massive double wooden doors with glass inserts reflecting back the sunlight, which blinds us. Reflex forces my hand up to block the sunlight. The doors open in toward the darkness. Music still plays in the background, but time stands still. Everyone stares into the emptiness. The doors frame our anticipation. Suddenly, a blur of white appears out of the shadows an entity of happiness with the biggest smile I have ever seen. Sunlight shines onto her like a spotlight, welcoming her from the darkness. Her white dress swirls as she steps down the stairs. Her white smile calms us with her genuine happiness. As she floats down the stairs, she turns to look at her father. I watch the whole thing, like a movie in slow motion while the background becomes still. My uncle supports her arm while they descend the stairs. He looks so proud. I see his eyes start to tear up as he keeps smiling at her. Her eyes say, I love you. His tears respond back, I love you too. Their eyes have a language of their own, which no one can deny. Pure love. We all keep our eyes glued on my uncle and his daughter through our joyful tears. Our tearful vision focused on their affectionate communication. Between the beautiful, glimmering entity 
and her father. They didn't know, but I knew. Their love is echoing as if it was the last time. A father and his daughter having their last goodbye before he gives her to another man. During the moment of transition, as her smile leaves her father and joins with another man, a tear runs down her cheek. Whoop. Just a second. Back up. Sorry. A tear runs down her cheek like the sparkle of a star as it was the son's purpose to give her father a final message that her love for him would never end. Even though she loves another man, that man will become her husband. Her father smiles again, understanding. Everyone sits down in unison as I looked at my father. I know he wants that same connection. Pure love between a father and daughter. He knows I love him dearly. His eyes speak loudly. His glistening eyes speak loudly. He wants our love to be shared with everyone. Like my uncle's love of his daughter. Even though I can't hear the moment of silence, didn't do this language justice. Eyes and tears are the proof that a connection of pure love does exist beyond speaking or hearing. Thank you so much. I hope that you enjoy this as much as I do. Uh, and I am honored to introduce deaf poet, deaf gender queer poet, Meg Day, is the author of Last Psalm at Sea, also winner, winner of the publishing Triangles, Audre Lord Award, a recipient of the Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling Scholarship, an NEA Fellowship in Poetry, and Day's recent work can be found in Best American Poetry 2020 and the New York Times. Day is assistant professor of English and creative writing at Franklin and Marshall College. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well then, I gotta find Emily. <laughs> hi. <laughs> oh goodness. Oh, hi, hi, hello, good evening. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Ryan, um, and for welcoming me to Inlandia. Um, can everybody see Emily okay? I don't know how you would confirm that for me, but. Meg, I can just jump in and say, if your view is set to gallery, you should see her. 
Beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, Emily and I are so excited to be joining you um, from across the country tonight. Uh, it's very late here, um, but we're delighted and excited to be included in such an important evening um, of deaf poets and storytellers. Can y'all get, I mean, I can't get over those young folks. Mm, um, those are incredible, incredible stories. Um, so thank you to Inlandia for welcoming us in National Poetry Month, um, which also overlaps with Deaf History Month. Thank you, of course, to Ryan um, for that beautiful poem. And to Emily, um, interpreting poetry is not uh, an easy skill to master. <laughs> and I'm so lucky to have um, such a skilled comrade by my side. Um, thank you to Janine and Erica uh, to Sal and Macy and Gabrielle, uh, and especially to Katie um, for making this happen. I'm grateful to all of you and all of you out there in, um, in video land <laughs> also. Thank you for being here. I can't see you, which makes this a little bit creepy. Um, we've tried to prioritize access tonight via a plethora of ASL interpreters um, and auto captioning. Uh, and recording, but if you require some other kind of access, I hope that you'll let us know. Um, I think the chat is disabled, but you can send it through the Q&A feature without trouble. Um, many of the poems that I'm gonna read tonight are from my next manuscript, which seeks to unburden itself of non-disabled and hearing expectations. Uh, I spent much of my coming up as a poet trying to conform, oddly, uh, trying to assimilate as a deaf poet writing in English. I was taught only to anticipate hearing readers and hearing audience members, uh, which encouraged me to prioritize a relationship with sound that isn't really all that intrinsic to my experience or, or to my practice as a poet or the practice that I wish to have as a poet. So I've been trying to unlearn a lot of things. Um, and some of these poems that I'll read tonight uh, track that unlearning and some of them are the result of, um, or benchmarks maybe of, of where I've been and how far I've come and inevitably how far I have to go. <laughs> this poem is called Obad Today. Last night I dreamt I'd forgotten my name or driven it off like a fox through the split rail and into the long grass that can't help but divulge the direction of the wind. More than once I've been without and more than once I've run my padded bones along the braided bottom teeth of summer, confusing heat with light and feeling for the peak that christens predators with sharper tongues than prey. There are some shades of night so tender, they swallow sound without chewing. Pretend this is the first time you've seen me crouch and tuck my hands under the resting scaffold of a body limp with sleep or worse. Pretend your teeth don't pull flesh from the peach's pit the way maggots eat around the tendons that hold the heart inside the chest of the fawn felled by a fox in the soundless down of that black yard. Where is the sun? Look at the long grass, open like a wound, where this small life left an even gentler night. Can you see its blood cross the door of my chest like a promise? Can you hear me screaming my last name into its neck? as if it would turn the earth. I'm having a weird cyborg moment. Um, sometimes, I don't know, people who have tech in their ears, do you, <laughs> this is so not the time to ask this question. Um, do you, does your tech sometimes connect to people? I live very close to my neighbor and sometimes I'm convinced that I'm picking up his Bluetooth. <laughs> um, but I think we're gonna be okay. Um, this next poet, when I was traveling abroad on the Amy Lowell in 2016, I spent a lot of time in museums. Um, I love museums and galleries. Uh, I miss them. 
Uh, but I came to understand them differently when I was living abroad and didn't know that nation's sign language and couldn't lip read their language. Um, museums are a place you can go and be together and not talk. Um, and uh, the artist Louise Bourgeois, uh, she was a, a, a visual and sculptural artist. Um, if you haven't seen her work, check it out. Some of it's so moving, some of it's deeply disturbing and I quite like her work. Um, but she has a series of prints from 2006, I think, 2006 or 2007, that focus on hands, um, which felt very much like my terrain at the moment. I was living abroad and, and here Louise Bourgeois was doing all of these things with prints of hands. And I was like, all right, Louise, maybe back up a little bit. Um, but so I borrowed this title from her. <clears throat> It's called 10 a.m. is when you come to me. In some other life, I can hear you breathing, a pale sound like running fingers through tangled hair. I dreamt again of swimming in the quarry and surfaced here when you called for me in a voice only my sleeping self could know. Now the dapple of the aspen respires on the wall and the shades cut its song a staff of light. Leave me, that me, in bed with the woman who said all the sounds for pleasure were made with vowels I couldn't hear. Keep me instead with this small sun that sips at the sky blue hem of our sheets then dips and reappears, a drowsy penny in the belt of Venus your oriole nodding slow and copper as it bobs against cotton in cornflower or clay. What a waste the groan of the mattress must be when you backstroke into me and pull the night up over our heads. Your eyes are two moons I float beneath and my lungs fill with a wet hum, your hips return, it's Sunday. Or so you say with both hands on my chest, and hot breath is the only hymn whose refrain we can recall. And then you reach for me, like I could have been another man. You make me sing without a sound. Many of the poems that, um, that I'm working into right now engage uh, with closed captioning. Um, I recently had a conversation with, with deaf poet Raymond A. Interboos, um, as a part of his first, uh, his, his BBC debut um, about closed captioning and, and reading sound, making sound visible. Um, but I'm really interested in, in the part in closed captioning uh, where the phrase inaudible comes up, the word inaudible appears on the closed captioning in brackets. Um, and I'm quite tickled by it for reasons that seem self-evident. Um, the, the part where we are uh, reading a sound, a representation of a sound that even the hearing people can't quite hear. <laughs> I quite like that. Um, but I started thinking about it in relation to uh, Gabrielle, Gabrielle Cavalcaresi's book, Rocket Fantastic. Have you all read this book? Um, and G. Calvo Caressi, they, they use the segno symbol. Um, it's a symbol from music to replace the pronouns um, in, a, in a section of the book. And Calvo Caressi's explained that the symbol, uh, when you read these poems aloud, that the symbol should be read uh, as an inhale of breath, uh, which I just love because tr pronouns, uh, they trouble me. Um, and they're always in pursuit of me. The conversation of pronouns just won't go away for me. Um, and so I, uh, I felt encouraged or maybe challenged to use inaudible, which is also a kind of, a kind of unspoken um, that comes to us via closed captioning, but in a different way um, in the spirit of her, of their uh, erasure, or maybe not erasure, but but Calva Caressi's uh, insistence on a different kind of presence, maybe. So this is called Portrait of My Gender as Inaudible. I knew I was a god when you could not agree on my name. 
and still none you spoke could force me to listen closer. Is this the nothing the antelope felt when Adam lit on his own entitling dubbed a family, genus, species? So many descendants became doctors, delivered babies, bestowed bodies, names, as if to say it is to make it so. Can it be a comfort between us, the fact of my creation? I was made in the image of a thing without an image, and silence too is your invention. Who prays for a God except to appear with answers, but never a body, a voice? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me because I was the one to say it. On the first day, there was no sound worth mentioning. If I too am a conductor of air, the only praise I know is in stereo. One pair, an open hand and closed fist will have to do. I made a photograph of my name. There was a shadow in a field and I put my shadow in it. You can't hear me, but I'm there. Um, this next poem I've never read before in reading. Mm. But recent days have pushed me back to it. Um, not just Trans Day of Visibility, uh, which was yesterday, but also the, the nationwide legislation deciding trans rights right now. Um, it's been difficult for me to find a way to put into poems the intersectionality of trans identity with disability. Um, I really refuse the idea that any of us are ever just deaf. Um, and so this poem is an erasure of sorts, which I think is maybe the inherited form of oppressed folks everywhere. <laughs> um, erasures can be dangerous and also life-giving, um, funny, but terrifying too. Um, sometimes I feel totally at ease being deaf and trans. And sometimes uh, like right now in this country, um, or every time I go through airport security, <laughs> uh, I feel absolutely terrified. So this is deaf erasure of the gospel according to the TSA agent at Atlanta International. Um, and every time I pause in this poem, the text of the poem reads inaudible in brackets like before. This is the good news. And we have a plan for you. Can you follow what I'm saying? Follow me. Bless you. There's no need to. Doesn't this happen to you all the time? I said, step in here. Why would you copy, copy that? I'm here with, yes, I'm here with. Now, like I was saying before, I'm not here to preach. You are what you are. Even Jesus wasn't believed and it's not like he could put some marker on his driver's license. Have you had the, my cousin had the, but the other way. Spread your, a little farther down the line and I would have been Paul or back from his lunch break. That's the power of right there. Somebody's looking out for you today. Next time you might not copy, copy that. I'm going to place my fingers here and then they need the room. Okay, that's enough. I need to go and tell them what I've seen. I'm just gonna read two more poems. Um, this next poem takes its title from uh, the 1990 greatest hit, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which states that accommodations will be granted to a disabled individual only if they are quote reasonable. Um, and it's a poem that um, 
includes some references to, um, to domestic violence. And so if you need to take care of yourself by turning off or looking away, please feel free to do that. And then when it is that I'm finished uh, reading, I'll put a bunch of asterisks in the chat. Um, so you'll know to come back. And that way everybody can sense. Reasonable accommodation. You've met me halfway between the door to our bedroom and the other I doubt is real only because you are always gesturing, there it is. As if getting to an exit is as simple as its existence. As if your body, real or imagined, does not make a door a taunt you can point to but not touch. You touch me like I'm a door that won't open. The first fight ended he too. My back to the wall and your body keeping it there. Every hand and mouth an act of contrition in an argument I was sure I'd misheard until you were kneeling to beg me stay. Only then did I understand yours was a language of secret orders and mine a language of hidden sounds you thought you had to teach me yourself. Tonight, my shoulders relax into the dimples they make in the drywall the pair of them joining the others in repetition down the whole way, a stampede through snow. Look at the tracks they've left, all the animals my body didn't mean to be. Tonight, there is no feast. Tonight, you are only sorry. God's name is the one I choose to say aloud when you touch me like you believe you could put a door anywhere if you just push hard enough. Like if I wasn't so unreasonable, I could just accommodate myself. Like if it's so hard, why don't you just leave? There it is. There I am, opening a door in a wall with a body I should want to exit. You touch me like I'm an animal that needs correcting. You touch me like it's for my own good. And wasn't this my request? Didn't I ask you to speak to me only with your hands? Can everyone see the asterisks there? It's unclear if the chat is available to our friends but I welcome you back. Um, this is the last poem that I'll read um, because I wanna have a conversation with Ryan. <laughs> um, uh, this poem came out of, uh, I don't know, meditation on mishearings. Um, I think that mishearings are a kind of hearing erasure that I feel good about. <laughs> they can provide a lot of permission accidentally. Um, and I'm grateful for them, even as, uh, as I think that um, they often cause a lot of misunderstanding. Y'all have been wonderful, I think. But thank you for being here. Um, this is called Elegy in Translation. Forgive me my deafness now for your name on others' lips. Each mouth gathers, then opens, and I search for the wave the fluke of their tongues should make. With the blow of your name in that mild darkness, I recognize, but can I explain as the same oblivious blue of hold the conch to your ear and hearing the highway loud and clear. My hands are bloated with the name signs of my kin who have waited for water to reach their ears or oil Grease from a fox with the goal of a hair, bare fat melted in hot piss, peach kernels fried in hog lard and tucked along the cave room for a cure, a sharp stick even, a jagged rock. Anything to wedge down deep to the drum inside that kept them walking away from wives, old or otherwise, and the tales they tell about our being too broken for their bearing, and yet they bear on, down, Forgive me my deafness for my own sound, how you mistook it for a wound you could heal. 
Forgive me the places your wasted words could have saved us from going had I heard you with my hands. I saw Joni live and still thought a gay pair of guys put up a parking lot. How could I have known you are worthless? Sounds like, should we do this? Even with the lights on, you let me say yes. So what? Johnny Nash can see clearly now Lorraine is gone. I only wanted to hear you see. The audiologist asks, does it seem like you're underwater? And I think only of your name. I thought it was you after I love, but memory proves nothing save my certainty. The chapped round of your mouth was the same shape while at rest or in thought or blowing smoke and all three make a similar sound. Thank you. Wow, that was beautiful, Meg. Thank you for sharing your poetry with everyone. Thank you, Ryan. Do we finally get to talk? Yeah, yeah, I'm so excited. I can't wait to talk with you again. Uh, I wanted to ask your perspective and your opinion about what's inspired you to write your poetry. Okay, uh, for everyone, before we begin, everyone, if you would like to ask a question, please go ahead and type that in the Q&A box. Okay, Meg, uh, I can't believe uh, I, the feelings as I was watching your poetry, all the different ones, the emotions in, in like you can feel it in the emotions in music. I wanna know what's inspired you to become a poet? Oh, what's inspired me to become a poet? I don't, I don't know. That seems like it would be an easy question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there is, uh, there are so many ways to answer this question, um, but I think that part of what keeps me in poetry is, is the camaraderie of the thing, that one can be alone and also together. Um, and I don't just mean like in terms of readings like tonight, but um, one of one of our young storytellers tonight, I think it was Macy, um, mentioned that she doesn't really stay, share her stories. Um, she just she you know lays in bed at night and signs them to herself, um, and that was very much my experience of being a young person. I felt like I was um, somehow singularly alone in the world, um, and that my own company. Uh, was all I had, though of course that wasn't true. There were people around me constantly. Um, but many of my memories as a young person is like talking to the moon <laughs> or, um, you know, creating stories when I couldn't sleep. And um, I think that maybe that's one point of origin that has trailed me. Um, not just as an inspiration, but as a kind of, um, I don't know, a way to be a part of the world, a way to feel less alone in it. So I don't know that that answers the question, but what about you, Ryan? Oh, oh, um, I, uh, if you ask me, I, why I became a poet a couple of years ago, if you asked me if I would become a poet, I would laugh at you. But now <laughs> I'm eating my words. I find myself just, just being enthralled with it. It's it just like we had mentioned before, just this disconnection, being able to be in your own world, making my own stories. 
for some writing them and then my poetry, I tend to use my memories so that I can relive my memories and express my emotions as well. Uh, again, I think it's just most beautiful to write creative writing, how to use the right word in the spot. And it helps with the visual visualization. I don't know if that answered your question. I'm not sure either. Yeah, yeah. I think that it's, um, I think it's a question that necessarily evolves over time. I think my answer would be different 20 minutes from now. I don't know what that says about me, but. <laughs> <laughs> And now I, uh, I'm wondering what kind of message that you hope to share with the audience through your poetry? Oh, what kind of message? I, for a long time, I felt the, the purpose of, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. I, I, I'm waiting for your answer, go ahead. Um, I think for a long time, I, I felt that uh, poetry was about having a voice. Um, and certainly I came up in a tradition that was about claiming or reclaiming one's voice uh, and taking up space and learning to occupy uh, the world in a way that was unapologetic. And I'm grateful for that mm, series of beginnings. Um, but I think as I've grown, and my priorities have changed and my politics have changed. I think more about the role of the poet, the responsibility of the poet, people don't really like that phrase. Um, but I really appreciate what poetry can do with regard to attention and the way that directing one's attention to something is a way of helping to preserve it. And so I kind of feel that way about the world, not just people, but the planet. And um, I, I suppose that's a kind of voice, but it doesn't feel, um, feels more turned outward now and not inward. Um, but maybe that's just me on my best days. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but that's my hope. My hope is that poems allow each of us to be in conversation with one another and learn from one another indeed, but, but particularly to direct our attention toward things um, with the hopes that we might be less willing to destroy them. Wow, that's a beautiful answer, especially there at the end, your response. <laughs> but what about you? Do you have like a, you have a message that you like want to send with your pawns. Mm. My message that many uh, changes, uh, the changes to my poetry, I, do, I want the audience to see when I'm writing that I'm speaking out about my struggles, my emotions, especially about my life as a deaf person living in this world with uh, unfair opportunities provided to the deaf and that I have to explain through the emotions, the difference about life using a cochlear implant uh, when I was growing up and then during the time when my implant broke and then I had the realization I had saw the world differently through a deaf perspective for sure and then again once I got my implant repaired my perspective shifted so I feel like I've got th three different worlds differently that I can express through my poetry do you feel like there's a, an avenue that's like best for that? Like poetry versus poetry, like the English or ASL? 
So I noticed that I tend to express best through English poetry because I write everything down. So this is my first night using ASL poetry and I realized there's so many changes to put it into ASL, it's so completely different, wow. So it was a really good challenge for me. I love that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Tonight, like this is the first time? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's why, you know, pounced on the opportunity. Lucky, we're lucky. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for being there, watching my poetry differently. Oh, and I do have another question um, I did want to ask you. Why do you use English instead of, instead of ASL in your poetry? That's a fair question. Um, and it's one that I don't get a lot because I'm often reading to hearing audiences. Um, the way that I have chosen to move through the world has largely abandoned um, cultural ties to deaf community. I don't mean to say that there aren't deaf people in my life or that I don't sign. Um, but I teach at a hearing institution. Um, I choose to voice my own poems. Um, I work with interpreters every day, uh, but I still uh, lecture in English. Um, and these are decisions through, you know, through different avenues, different choices. Um, some of them my own, some of them not. Um, that have allowed me to arrive at a place where it doesn't feel like mine to have. And that's a personal decision. I'm not saying that other folks who might be in my position would not have access to ASL poetry, but um, I move in circles that are so saturated by hearing people um, that it's very difficult to have ASL not become tokenized or I don't know, to not like collect on that cultural capital that ASL is having in this particular moment. Um, it's a lot of conversations about clout and um, I, don't, I don't want to take up more space um, that is than is necessary. Um, and for right now, this is what I've chosen. And I'm trying to find different ways to move in those spaces that are, um, I don't know, authentic to my experience, that are real for me. So maybe I'm working my way back toward that. I don't know. Also, it's hard, right? Like, like this is <laughs> <journey>. <laughs> mm -hmm. I agree. Like it's really hard. <laughs> I just freaking out about making mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when I see like the masters doing it so well, uh, you know, like I came up watching Ella Mae Lentz and, and Patrick Graybill and Clayton Valley. And like, I just watched them and I'm like, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to stick with English. <laughs> <laughs> I have to agree with you. Uh, when I was doing the ASL poetry, I was like, whoa, this is a hard, this is a challenge for me, but I'm happy that I made through it. And I'm also happy that I made through this beautiful challenge. I doubt I'll do it again. I might maybe one day in the future if the opportunity arises again. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, uh, it seems that we do have a question from the Q&A box. For Meg, has your writing process evolved over the years? From Elizabeth is the question. 
Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, it's a generous question and I don't want to squander it. Um, my writing process, I hope, has has become more uh, disability centric. What do I mean by that? Um, when I went through graduate school, I spent a lot of time trying to assimilate into what I felt was American poetics and what I was being told was quote unquote, good, good poetry. Um, and that involved a lot of labor uh, in, in service of phonocentrism and hearing people. Um, I would spend late nights memorizing hearing rhymes in English, um, trying to better understand meter, um, how to scan a poem in English with, with the stresses without being able to experience it, sense it, hear it, maybe in the way that many hearing poets can. Um, and I was really desperate to master uh, what I was being told was inaccessible to me or unreachable, that I would never be the poet that my comrades were because I couldn't hear. And so my poems didn't have the sonic qualities that hearing poets had. Um, and there was this argument that poems aren't poems without sound. <laughs> uh, and I believed it for many years um, and, and sought to master it. Uh, so much so that when my book came out, um, I was frequently told what a good ear I had, which was a moment of realization for me. Uh, <laughs> that was kind of devastating. <laughs> um, and it, it really did shock me into trying to backtrack and try to understand in new ways what I had done and how to undo it. Um, and so I've spent the last many, many years trying to unlearn much of that education. Um, what is my own sound? What is it like? Do I like it? Do you like it? Do I care if you like it? Um, so, it, that's kind of where I'm at. It was like trying to work myself back to um, what it means to assume that there are deaf readers and there are deaf audience members and that there are indeed deaf poets writing in English. Here we are, here's two of them at least. Um, and, and there are many of us, many comrades um, in the country and out of it, beyond it. So I think that that's one significant way in which my process or my work has evolved over time. Um, and I'm grateful for the people, um, poets and, and publishers and editors who are interested in centering disabled work, deaf work, um, proudly and not, as, uh, not in a tokenizing way. That has really shifted things, I think, or is beginning to. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Okay, I do have another question from Adrian. Would you be able to explain the difference between ASL and English poetry? Uh, that's up to you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, no. Um, yeah, I can. I let me make some vague approximations that are probably readily wrong um, and <laughs> and easy to disprove. Um, you know, when when we had the young folks up earlier and they were telling stories, um, and and I think it might have been Erica. Um, I think that she was the one that mentioned that there's a lot of similarities between ASL storytelling and English poetics, um, that their overlap in, see already the vocabulary is going to fail me. Um, there's overlap in metaphor, in, in rhyme, um, 
but our sense of rhyme is via hand shape and movement and location. It's temporal and ephemeral and embodied. Um, like I, how to compare the, the single dimension of the page with, with the many dimensions of the body. I think I, that's the answer, right? That the page endures also, it is a kind of archive and Ryan's poem, for example, is already over. And we have a recording of it, but it's not the same thing. It's different. Um, so they use different mediums and they use different tools. Um, and I do actually believe that their aims are, if not different than separate. I don't know that um, the English poetry can do everything that ASL poetics can. Um, and I don't mean that necessarily as a slight, I just mean it in the way that like, um, you know, some coffee makers will also make you breakfast. <laughs> um, like there's just, there's more to work with. Um, so that was maybe a foolish comparison, but um, I, I encourage you to watch ASL poems. You can find just so, so many of them um, on the internet. Um, and there are many, many ASL poets living and, and working, performing today. So um, I encourage you to seek them out. Um, Peter Cook was someone who like blew my mind as a young person, trying to see the overlaps of genre and the way that genre could be exploded and not just explored. Um, but there are lots of folks, so I encourage you to seek them out and then just watch them. You don't have to necessarily know what's going on to understand a thing. There's semantic sense and then there's intuitive sense. So, good luck. Or you could learn ASL. I mean, that's the other thing. That's a good choice. Yeah. Yeah, and it could be fun also to learn ASL and you could use poetry, hand shapes, rhymes. There's the difference between English and ASL poetry, hand shapes, rhymes, using your body and not having to use every single word in English signing it that when you're writing in English there are the rules that you have to follow for the grammar and there are grammar rules that can be broken in poetry depending on the situation <laughs> so yeah okay we do have another question related for Meg and do you see how Emily's interpreting your poetry uh both of you are inspiring the skills with your language that's from jake um emily is incredible emily do you want to no you're welcome no Jake. okay um I, emily and i actually don't like talk a lot about this <laughs> it feels uh like a little like a mystery <laughs> Um, there's a little bit of magic to it. Um, one thing that we tried like recently was that I sent um, an audio recording of me reading poems to Emily and then um, I, Emily, I'm just like, I'm telling stories now. You walk around your house listening to it? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, Emily's incredibly gifted. Should I just brag on her? It would be super awkward for her to interpret. Um, <laughs> um, no, she's incredibly talented. Emily and I met accidentally for the first time like f f five years ago, six years ago, um, when I had an interpreter booked for a, for a, a large hall, an event, a poetry event at a large hall, like a large auditorium. Um, and like two hours, three hours before the event began, uh, the other interpreter bailed um, and it's unclear to me still if it was having to do with the content of my 
work or uh, it's unclear. Um, but Emily got called in <laughs> um, and she just, I mean, she's just incredible. Uh, she has a real affinity for, she has a real poetic voice. She has poetic hands um, and poetic sensibility, both as a person, as an interpreter, both. Um, part of what I love about working with her is that we have, I think I can say this, we have such good chemistry. Does that feel true to you? Yeah. <laughs> um, it would be an awkward time to say no. Um, <laughs> um, but we do we do work together really well. I trust her, uh, deeply trust her. And also I can, while she's interpreting, I can like heckle her and she just like, like a champ. Um, <laughs> and so it allows me to be myself, uh, which I think is really difficult to find with interpreters. Um, unfortunately, there's, they're overworked, they're underpaid. You never get one twice um, in the best of circumstances. And so um, this relationship is really special to me. Um, and it's important to to preserve it and support it, um, not just because of poems, but um, because I think it's it's unusual and and sacred um, to be somebody's hands or to be somebody's ears um, and to be the conduit for their poems in a way that truly I can't be. Uh, I think Ryan, maybe you understand this better than most, but it's quite difficult to like get a poem right. And sometimes when I watch Emily, I think, oh, I understand myself better now because I'm watching her in my own language. Um, and also she witnesses me in a way that not a lot of people can. Um, she reads me in both languages. Uh, and so many of my poems are written in English, but they're written with ASL in mind. And so there are sign alliterations and uh, extended metaphors. And I'm thinking primarily of, maybe where hearing poets think about sound, I'm thinking about signs um, in a kind of, I don't know, ASL English contrapuntal. Um, and it's really special to have someone appreciate that. Um, it's not a secret. It's just that there's such a small population of people who would notice. Um, so maybe Emily is my ideal reader is really what I mean to say. Um, I feel very, very lucky. Wow, that's a beautiful answer. And I'm wondering, you said, do you see yourself through the signing rather than the sound or that I under, I do understand that perspective, but would you say that similar to visualization or just seeing yourself mirrored through Emily? Oh, interesting. I think just through visualization. Um, I don't see Emily and see myself. Is that what you're asking? Yes, mm -hmm. that is my question. Yeah, that would be lovely because um, Emily's amazing and and talented and you know so smart and gorgeous and whatever. But no, unfortunately, I don't see myself when I look at Emily. <laughs> um, but I but I do see maybe um, what is possible. Like there's something about working with someone who uh, is invested in your work and also understands the betweenity of your linguistic experience um, that is so, it's not just validating, it's world making. It's, it's unlike anything else. It's like who you are when you're alone is sometimes how I feel when I'm, reading poems with Emily, or when I watch Emily's interpretation of my poems, I think, oh, there it is. There I am. And it's not Emily. It's not like, but there's something else happening there. I don't know. I don't have a lot of language for it. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. Okay, uh, there is a very interesting question from Cynthia. Would you say that English is two dimensional and ASL is three dimensional? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would say that English is one dimensional and ASL is 10 dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, there are so many other things happening when one signs than, um, than it is immediately obvious. It's, it's not just what you can see the hands doing, one's hands doing. It has, um, it's like, do you know what micro expressions are? It's like, um, mm -hmm. they're like microaggressions for your face, right? It's like <laughs> when someone comes out wearing something instead of saying like, you're wearing that, uh, it's like the little, hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that's a part of the, what's a bad word for it, grammar. That's part of the grammar of ASL. It's part of the syntactical, structure of, of how meaning gets made. Um, what dimension is that? Right? Like what, what dimension is a micro expression? What dimension is the way that if I turn my shoulders, I can be 16 different speakers? Um, what, what dimension is um, putting my heart in my chest and then moving it out here? And showing you how it's made and then putting it back All right like what dimension is that i we're, we're out of this world now right like this is physics beyond my understanding um but yes i think i think that's in the in the right direction one and three dimensions it's a, it's a little more expansive than that though i think Wow. Wow. That's a very thought out answer. I learned something new here. Thank you so much for sharing that answer. Um, how are we doing on time? It seems. Yeah, we're a little bit in overtime, but nobody wants to stop you. We could listen all night, Meg. <laughs> this has been great. The questions and the answers. So um, I think I would like to wrap things up by bringing Erica back for just a minute and then we'll um, say our goodbyes. But I feel like I have learned so much tonight. I really, um, that whole idea of embodiment and the nuance in that poetry on the page is a single dimension versus poetry uh, written for ASL is many dimensioned and it yeah. seems like there are so many nuances that would be impossible to translate like with any language and erica saying yes yeah. Do yes we have i definitely agree with you about the 10 or more uh as far as a, a person using these bent knees perhaps running into hitting a wall that hand shape and then falling down with the addition of the facial expression, the speed of the movement, the location, uh, how that experience went. It, it, yes, definitely. Well, this has really been illuminating and I really want to say thank you to, to Erica and to CSDR for what they are doing to bring up the next generation of writers. And I look forward to having future events where we can feature ASL poetry, ASL storytelling, and for a, an audience who can uh, appreciate the nuances and the structure of ASL. And I think we've had a lot of writers in our audience tonight. I'm looking through our list 
and I'm sure they have lots of questions and I hope that we all got uh, so much out of it. I took, I took all kinds of notes. <laughs> I'm going to be um, quoting you, Meg, forever. The, that whole idea of um, embodiment, I think I have, I definitely have a better understanding. So does anybody have any last questions or last thoughts they would like to share um, either with Erica or with our poets? If so, um, I know we had some comments about, you know, being blown away. And I think that has been I really true. Tonight. Definitely, Brian saying, I definitely do appreciate the interpreters being here. Yes. So thank you all. And I'm sorry our students have already left us for the evening, but thank you to Sal and Macy and Gabe, Gabrielle. And on behalf of Inlandia Institute, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, if you don't already, please like and follow Inlandia and CSDR and go find Meg and follow her too. And Ryan, I look forward to seeing you at future poetry events and we will all be here again um, soon. So have a wonderful night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.